this okay. playlist very so seriously. So the idea of putting together a playlist, right? I take it really personally because <clears throat> to me, I've been obsessed like with music since I was like any of us, like since I was a child. And there is, there's so much music that I feel formed me and that is so important to my aesthetic. Um, and the idea of, of curating something like I once had to do, I won an award for, it was WNYC and PR, right? And the award was, it was called the, um, the must have festival. And you had to write in to the radio station and tell them what CD or album would you have to have with you on a desert island and why? And I had, it happened to be like six in the morning and I heard this thing. So I, I went right to my computer and wrote my little thing about, and it was at the time it was Sir John Barbaroli and Janet Baker doing the Kinder Toten Leader, the Songs for Songs of Wayfair and the Rupert Leader. And I won. And the, the <laughs> prize was that you got to um, go on the radio with David Garland for three hours and curate your own radio program. And I loved doing it. <clears throat> I really had fun because I, if, if anybody has a collective taste, <laughs> I mean, like, my taste is all over the place. And I didn't even, you saw what happened yesterday where I was like, I would put one thing here and then I had to replace it. Like at one point I had Ryu Ryu Shu there only because it's one of the first little pieces of music I was obsessed with when I was a little boy. But then I thought, <clears throat> I don't have as much time with Michael. So I want to make sure that it's, that the pieces are seminal for me. You know what I mean? And, uh, but anyway, so I took it, <clears throat> I took it seriously. Curious, you know, because I lived on the South Shoreland Island, which is like, 40 minutes from the city, I would take the train every Saturday to the city and go to the Lincoln Center Library for the Performing Arts. And I would take out, like, the, you could take up piles of records like this. <laughs> so, like, I knew every opera written in the 20th century, every song cycle, every, you know, I was, like, in my room listening to Luigi Nono, and, you know, I knew everything. And... But meanwhile, not intellectually, I just absorbed music. And I didn't know I was gonna be a composer. Um, you know, uh, and when I was like in junior high school, I wrote a, a, a concert of anti-war songs um, and wore, wore a black armband and did a concert in seventh grade. But I wasn't, I got into college as a pianist at Carnegie Mellon and I was young. I left college at my senior year, I mean, high school in my senior year. And I even remember when I was getting admitted into Carnegie Mellon, there were three um, pieces of music I was completely obsessed with. And they very much express who I am in the world. And I was not yet a composer. It was Shostakovich had written his 14th symphony, which is the symphony for bass and soprano and chamber orchestra dedicated to Benjamin Britten using all poems about death, like Garcia Lorca and Apollinaire. And um, then Stephen Sondheim had written his musical Follies and someone to take, took me to see it. I didn't even like musicals, you know, but they took me to see Follies. And I thought it was gonna be a boring show about the Ziegfeld Follies. And of course it was this show about, you know, broken dreams, fractured lives, you know, just, it was dazzling and people's um, involvement with their past and with their own ghosts. And it was very haunting and heartbreaking. And then Ned Roram had written a new cycle. And by the way, it's interesting because Phyllis Curtin was somehow some of the glue here because she, she did the recording of the 14th Symphony that I was obsessed with at the time, which was um, Eugene Ormandy. And then Ned Roram wrote her a cycle called um, Ariel which was using um, Sylvia Plath poems. Um, and it was for clarinet, piano, and Phyllis Curtin. And I loved Sylvia Plath. I mean, poetry and music were sort of my first loves. You know, my oldest sister was a writer and she would put me to bed by reading poetry to me. So 
if you look at like those three pieces of music, like, you know, Roram, Shostakovich, Stephen Sondheim, and then I met Carnegie Mellon for a little while as a pianist, and I'm thinking, this is so not what I want to do. Like, you know, I would be in a practice room, you know, practicing a Chopin nocturne for four hours, thinking like, this is so not it, and I am never going to be playing these pieces in public. And I just, it just occurred to me one day that maybe I'm a composer. And then really what happened was, the only composer I knew to model myself after really was I was really obsessed with Ned Warren, not just the way he wrote, but his diaries, you know, his journals. And I liked the idea of being like he was in the world. It was like Ned Warren and Gertrude Stein both seemed like interesting people to be in the world, you know? Um, so I started setting the poems of all of my friends to music at Carnegie Mellon. And that was my first impulse was to set text to music and um, really from there, you know, and then I became an actor at Carnegie Mellon. And, you know, I had like a drug problem and a drinking problem, and, but, but I'm glad I studied acting because I feel like a very strong impulse for me in setting text to music is what does it mean for the performer? Like, what are they going to be saying and doing and feeling and thinking and I think of every song as sort of a miniature opera. And then obviously when I started writing opera, I felt like the dramatic impulse was true to me. You know, and I feel like I'm grateful that my taste in music is so eclectic that I would basically use anything to tell a story. You know what I mean? Anything to, uh, to push a plot forward, to illuminate a character, I mean, you saw when we were doing 27, which you conducted so beautifully, the world premiere, you know, when Alice is introducing um, the wives of geniuses, right? And there was this little thing in Royce Fabric's libretto and I said, oh no, Royce, this is a number. This is like a big Broadway number. And he was like, well, what do you mean? Explain it to me. And I did. And so that's what we ended up you know, I have a sense of what something should be. Whether other people think that's right or wrong, I trust it, you know? I think one of the uh, amazing things is when, when you sing one of your works, which you do uh, in rehearsals, and if people have a question in rehearsal, you you can sit down at the piano and you just start to sing. So you feel the sense of the breath and where the dramatic emphasis is. You're right. When you do that, you are. We are all instantly transported into the dramatic world that you are trying to create, which I think is is amazing. It's almost like you just plug into that that quick drama uh, without any. <laughs> you don't even need to rev up to it. It's just like bam, here I am in Gertrude Stein's room or one of the other um, one of the other songs. Um, I thought it would be interesting to talk a little bit about how you go about bringing the worlds of voice and instrumental ensemble or orchestra together to support each other because i think that is a big that that is the as far as the music goes in opera like that is the that's the synthesis that either works or truly doesn't work to make an opera a fantastic um whole and i just yeah. wonder what your approach is because some of the examples that we have on the playlist are um are re really indicative of how different composers use instrumental and vocal forces together. Yeah, fantastic examples, right? I mean, that's what, one thing I'm excited about talking about today, but I've always thought of, you know, even um, when I write piano accompaniments, I mean, there, I always think of music is a conversation between the people that are making music. It's never, like the worst thing for me is when I go to a, a, a concert and a singer is singing and a pianist is playing and the pianist just uses the unicorda and you just hear a, like a little fog behind the pianist. That is so the antithesis of my intention. I feel like they're equal partners and they are both speaking and telling a story, sometimes simultaneously sometimes in counterpoint with one another. Sometimes they have differing opinions. And sometimes that conflict is exactly the kind of drama I want to bring out. And so um, I feel the same way with, with orchestral texture, with instruments. It's a 
conversation that everyone is having. Everything is theater to me. And that's the thing. The orchestra is just more theater, more voice, more commentary, more, uh, you know, and like you've done two pieces of mine that I, I'm proud of, right? 27 and Grapes of Wrath. And both of those, I feel like orchestrally are somewhat, they're both epic and intimate. Do you know what I mean? I mean, ideally, like, it's funny, especially with Grapes of Wrath, I'm glad someone like, even though you don't run into uh, the companies that have enough money for this most of the time, but my dream is that eventually every company will have a sound designer because um, I don't want to mic singers because um, I feel like my aesthetic was born out of the opera I grew up on, but it has been flavored by and tempered by the fact that my adult, my entire adult life, I've been listening to music on headphones. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned the microphone thing because I, I also believe that because our world is now in these guys and yes. the headphones that you're wearing and the sophisticated sound systems, that a lot of the operas, at least as far as opera is concerned, that that are performed these days were always imagined for smaller spaces. And when yes. you have theaters that are at a minimum 1,800 seats going to 4,000 seats, what is that audience member experiencing for two hundred dollars? And um, and I, I I have been for years saying when people when companies uh, that are loath to admit they do it anyway say oh you know Michael we're we're actually going to give that a little boost say yes please just yes. don't worry about it the audience is never going to criticize you for that there may be a purist here and there but by and large the um, purists will hear always it. be the critics. I mean, that's the thing. It's rarely the audience members who are really happy to hear it. And the truth is, if you want a younger audience, if you want to attract younger people, they are like, and you want them to have the same experience that they're going to have. I mean, look at all those people that go to those simulcasts. I mean, the absolute yeah. truth is a lot of people go to those rather than go to the opera because they can hear it. Yeah. And they right. can see it. I mean, I, I was stunned. I went to see The Nose at the Met right, the Shostakovich, I loved it. But then when I saw it, the simulcast, and you could see Paolo Jat, what a wonderful, incredible, detailed, subtle actor he was. None of it, you got none of that from the theater. You got a general sense of he's good, but, and I talked about this with Bart Scher, who's, you know, his uh, great director. The board said, yeah, you don't get to see that stuff. That's why we're so excited doing my new Met piece at Lincoln Center because it's in a 300 seat house. You see everything. I've been talking to the, the folks who run these opera companies, general directors, as I've passed through working with their companies and have, have challenged them to think, do we actually, is, is, the, is the young artist development programs that focus at the moment solely on vocalists and pianists actually should be a wider breadth where you maybe you instead of having six vocalists or even four maybe you have one or two vocalists but then you have a sound designer uh, you have a lighting designer that are coming up through the ranks technical director young artists let's call them coming up through the ranks because that is what's going to help us define um, what the future of opera presentation is I hate to say it because I love singers and I love the, the programs by and large are, are interesting and they're doing a lot of good work to help but really uh when it comes down to what the future of the opera needs in the next like the medium term oh my goodness it's these it's people in total my theater yes and it has to be total theater that is such a great idea because that's what it is and that's what i wish you could see michael we you know we just like rehearsed for two months into in peril and then had like three weeks of previews and then had to close and we'll open again next fall but we had no one in the room had ever rehearsed an opera that long, right? Like it was so such detailed work. And then we were performing eight times a week, you know, and we had double cast like the, the main role. And, but that to see your work grow to, I saw what I saw, like, I don't know, 24 performances of my opera and it hadn't even opened yet. So of course I came home 
I, I came up here for the, when we all got kicked out of New York and I, um, I rewrote the opera, you know, I just, it was like, and frankly, it didn't, you know, it, it was just something I saw so much of it. I thought, oh, I can make that better. I can make that better. You know, it was so exciting, but you never get to do that. We need to think of, of opera as total theater. Music is theater. To me, opera is the best art form. It's the best art form. You get everything in opera. You get great painting, you get great poetry, you get great music, you get great acting, you get great singing. When it works, opera is the most exciting thing on earth. And one great performance can change your whole life and you're like a drug addict. You'll, right. you'll go to 400 horrible performances waiting for that one good one again. Right. You know well, I, I, mean? I think I think you're right on the on the preview thing. I think it's the it is the it is the 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 weakest link in the chain, especially yeah. with new opera, that we we confine that creative process into the um the the process the typical process for putting on La Boheme or Magic Flute, um that two and a half rehearsal weeks, the few days in the theater, and you ram it all together and you say, hey everybody, this is a brand new piece, and and you're from the moment. You start on day one of the rehearsals, you're done. Like the, that cake is cooked because there's no time totally. to make the changes. That's right. So I actually think that is the that's the next a, a massive evolution that has to happen for our field to really it, pop in new in creating new work. And it might have to happen in smaller works that are affordable, so that all the other stuff is doable. And I mean, we're, I mean, I'm older than you, Michael, but. In none of our lifetimes. I mean, this is the biggest paradigm shift probably we will see in our lifetimes, right? Yeah. It's the biggest, fattest thing that has happened since a world war, really. Right. Or, yeah, since the world war, since World War II. That's, that affected the entire world this way. Yeah. It's going to be really interesting to see what world we have when this is done and what what art means. And, you know, but... As I said in that class last week, the only thing that usually remains of a civilization is its culture. Right. 